This is Duke University. So for our study, we were really interested in this phenomenon of what's been called the long tail effect. When you move sales online, you see a different distribution of sales. People are buying different types of, of products. And so one of the classic examples, if you compare a bookseller like Amazon with a traditional one like Barnes & Noble, the types of books people are producing on Amazon are fundamentally different than the ones they're buying at Barnes & Noble. So for instance, they call the long tail effect because you see an increase in sales of obscure products that you would never even find in a bricks and mortar store like Barnes & Noble. And in some studies, they've shown they make up about 25% of Amazon sales. So it's a large chunk of purchases. Previous studies have shown that the driver of this phenomenon is that Amazon has no constraints on how many books it can keep in its warehouse. Whereas at Barnes & Noble, there's just a limit to how many books they can have on the shelves at any point in time. Also online, it's very easy to search for products. They have recommendations for you. There's a search box so you can find these obscure titles. Wouldn't be possible to do that if you're offline at a Barnes & Noble. We thought another important characteristic of online sales is what studies have called the online disinhibition effect. Right. This ties in directly to the classic New Yorker cartoon that says on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, which means you might do things or purchase things online that you wouldn't in real life. A good example of this is the recent bestseller, Fifty Shades of Grey. Some people say this was a big hit bestseller because it started on the Kindle. And the Kindle, nobody knows what type of book you're reading. There's no cover. No one sees what you're purchasing at the bookstore. So people felt free to purchase a genre they normally wouldn't. Another example of the online disinhibition effect, this online pharmacy is prompting customers to come to the site to purchase the embarrassing personal care products they wouldn't feel comfortable going to a CVS or Walgreens to buy. But online, when no one sees what you're purchasing, you're more comfortable buying some of these more embarrassing products. Online disinhibition effect might also affect elections. Traditional polls are done in person or over the phone, and recent studies have shown that Donald Trump is doing a lot better in online polls than traditional polls because potentially people are very embarrassed to say they're going to support him when they're talking to another person. But online, when no one sees who you're voting for, you might be freer to, to say you're going to support a candidate that you will in the anonymous voting booth in November. Another good example comes from The Onion. They said a man's ashamed of himself after a cashier reads his food order back to him. That's exactly the type of phenomenon we're going to look at in our studies. You might change what you purchase when someone's in front of you at the store or at the counter. Right? But when you're online, it's anonymous. There's no sense of shame in what you're purchasing. That's going to fundamentally change what you decide to purchase. Trying to study this topic forces us to overcome some key challenges to find the right empirical settings to isolate the effects of embarrassment from other common attributes that might be affecting sales as well. So as I showed you already with the Amazon Barnes & Noble example, if we want to compare sales across two different channels, we have to be very careful to make sure that the product variety and search capabilities are equivalent across the two because that might be affecting sales. We also want to make sure that the order attributes are similar. When you purchase something online like a book, it might take one or two days to arrive. Maybe that affects what you decide to purchase as opposed to Barnes & Noble when you get it immediately. Finally, we also want to be very careful to make sure that the types of customers are the same across the two channels. Right, people who purchased online, especially 15, 20 years ago, right, these were in the vanguard. They were the typical customers that we see today where everyone's purchasing things online. So we want to make sure that these customers are constant across the two channels. And it's not different customer types that are driving sales versus the differences in the ordering methods. We look at two empirical settings that allow us to overcome these empirical challenges of isolating the effects of embarrassment from other drivers of sales. The first, we look at a pizza store that introduced online ordering. Online ordering is great because we get to see what customers are doing before and after the introduction of the internet, and that's fundamentally going to change what they purchase at the pizza store. After the introduction of online ordering, customers made more complicated orders, and as a result, the number of calories in the orders went up as well. In a second setting, we look at alcohol sales at a liquor store in Sweden. This is run by the government in Sweden, and historically, all sales were done behind the counter, like at a pharmacy, but then they decided to experiment with a self-service format that's more familiar to all of us, and that switch allows us to look at what happens to sales when there's social interaction, talking to the cashier to purchase your product, versus self-service when you're going to the shelves and it's more anonymous, you don't have to order the product from anyone. Both of these settings allow us to disentangle the different effects, and we can focus specifically on social interaction and the order process and how that affects sales, leaving aside all those other key challenges we talked about just a moment ago. We overcome these empirical challenges in some important ways in our study. 
First, we look at product variety, which is constant across the pizza setting and the alcohol setting. Online orders at the pizza store are the same as over the phone or over the counter. Type of products available are the same. And at the liquor store, the menu didn't change before and after they switched to self-service. Search capabilities are also equivalent across these different channels because there really is no search involved for pizza orders or buying liquor at the alcohol store. Order attributes are also very similar. For pizza, just changing how you order, whether it's over the phone or online, you're still getting your pizza delivered to your home, and so that doesn't change the order process itself. For the liquor stores, again, you're still in the store. The only difference is you're talking to a cashier to get your bottle versus picking it off the shelves yourself. And finally, the customer types, we can control for them statistically by looking at, on the pizza store, customers who bought products before the introduction of online order and see what they were purchasing, and then compare that to what happens when they start to make their orders online. In the alcohol store, we see fundamentally an experiment. The government-controlled liquor store experimented with changing the formats, and so this is a controlled, randomized trial. So now I'll provide some more detail about the empirical settings of our study. The first is the pizza store, Hungry Howie's. They're a regional chain that has stores all over the country, and they have a few in the Triangle area, and we look at one based in Raleigh. So here's an example of a typical order at Hungry Howie's. This customer purchased five items, right, pretty standard. He made some instructions to take toppings off or add some toppings, right, but nothing fundamentally interesting about this type of order. This is a common order you'd see over the phone or over the counter. When Hungry Howie's introduced its website ordering about 10 years ago, you get to go into the website, click the type of product you want to purchase, a pizza or breadsticks, and you customize it a bit. You pick the type of crust, the toppings, and then you make your order. Pretty simple, nothing that fancy. But when customers started to move their orders online, they made many more instructions and really customized their orders. So here's an example of a person who had several instructions, one half with lots of meats, one half with lots of veggies. This is a very complicated order. It might be embarrassing to do this over the phone when you have to give these detailed instructions to someone at the store or at the counter when there are people behind you getting agitated that you're taking so long making this customized order. So I think it's a representative of the online disinhibition effect. When you are online, it's anonymous, and no one's judging you for making this very complicated, complex order. You're free to pick all the toppings you really enjoy. We saw the online disinhibition effect come up in other aspects of the orders as well. For instance, this customer is playing a little bit of a joke in the store. He said, draw a dragon on the box for me. You wouldn't see this type of behavior when it's in person or over the phone, but you do see it online because it's anonymous and no one's going to be judging you for, for being a jerk and trying to have a joke at the store's expense. And here's an example of the dragon they drew for this customer. So we had some important findings from our pizza study. First, calories in these orders went up about 3%. That doesn't sound like a lot, but in the typical order, that's 100 to 200 calories. The number of instructions went up 14%. Again, an important change to what was happening offline. And this was really good for the store. Their profits from online ordering went up 20%. Initially, online orders were just a small portion of their overall sales. But as it's become more prevalent now, it's the majority of their sales. Their profits have gone up a lot because people are free to order more calories and make more instructions. So that's really improving the company's bottom line. And from a statistical standpoint, the econometrics, this setting was great because we could rule out a lot of alternative explanations, some of which we already talked about, but other things like, was it just easier to make complicated instructions online? Well, one way to rule that out, we looked at very simple instructions like ordering double or triple portions of toppings. Those went way up online, even though it's really easy to say double bacon, triple bacon over the phone. The fact that we see that go up online suggests to us that it's because people are less embarrassed to make that kind of order when it's anonymous. In our second setting, we look at the government-run alcohol stores in Sweden. And Sweden's interesting because, historically, they had all their sales over the counter, like at a pharmacy. So the process would be you'd go up to the counter, and they'd hand you a menu, and from that menu you can order products. And a lot of these products turn out to be hard to pronounce. So think of a French wine or a Scotch whiskey, things that you might fumble over when you're trying to order in person. Right? And that might be embarrassing for you if you look unsophisticated by mispronouncing the name of a French wine. And so you'd be less comfortable doing that if it's at the counter talking to the cashier. So great virtue of this setting for our purposes was that a lot of the products had a phonetic spelling on the menu, which suggested to us that these were the ones that were considered hard to pronounce. So we looked at what happened to sales of their products when the government-run stores switched to self-service. Before they did a wide rollout, they did an experiment of 14 stores. 
They paired them up based on characteristics like population and income. Seven, they kept in the traditional over-the-counter format. And seven, they changed to the self-service format. Our findings from the sales format change, we found that sales of harder to pronounce products went up 8%. Again, this is a big difference because the only thing that changed was how you're ordering the product. They had the same types of products on the shelves or in the back of the store was over the counter. The advertisements didn't change, promotions didn't change, prices didn't change. The only thing that changed was how the customer was ordering the product. In the one case, they had to go to the cashier and ask for it by name. In the other, they could go to the shelf and pick it up so they wouldn't be embarrassed to, if they didn't know how to pronounce it. With that 8% change in hard to pronounce products, the sales concentration fell 19%. This is again in line with this long tail effect where now you're widening out the sales distribution, these obscure hard to pronounce products that weren't being purchased as much when it was over the counter. Now they're making up a larger chunk of sales. To summarize our main findings, we've shown that social interaction has a large impact on sales. When companies remove some social interaction from their sales channels, like moving it online, for instance, the sales of embarrassing products go up quite a bit. For the pizza store, that meant orders had more calories and more complicated instructions. For the liquor stores, that meant customers were comfortable buying hard to pronounce products they might be embarrassed to mispronounce in front of someone else. This had a large impact on the sales distribution at these stores. Now these obscure products that people would be too embarrassed to buy in front of others, now they're making up a larger share of sales at these stores. And as a result, the store's profits have gone up quite a bit as well. If you want to see more details of this study, especially the statistical analysis, please visit my website.